everybody. It's Tim McDonald here with the Community Manager Hangout that we do every Friday at 2 p.m. And today we have a very, uh, very special topic. And I know a lot of people might go, what does customer experience have to do with being a community manager? But if you know me, if you've been here in this group before, you know that community management is much more than just social media. It is a whole complex skill set that it takes to really perform your job well, and it, this might not apply to everybody, but it applies to many community managers, the customer experience. And so today I have a very special guest, uh, Jeannie Walters, who I know, she's a personal friend of mine from Chicago. We served on their social media cl club um, Chicago board together. Uh, we work very closely together, and we're also personal friends. So this is a very special occasion for me to have Jeannie here, and we'll get to her in a little bit. Um, but first of all, I just want to tell everybody that we do do this on the Google Hangout. It is being broadcast on My Community Manager, which is mycmgr.com, so you can watch it there. We are also on Twitter using the hashtag CMGRHangout. Um, so if you are able to watch and tweet along, we will be asking the questions there, so feel free to, uh, to join us on Twitter as well, where we have today, um, Sherry uh, uh, Rohde is in our Hangout. She's usually on Twitter only, so she's going to be doing the Twitter chat. And also, we have Brandy McCollum, who is Little Waves. That's Little Waves. The only vowel that you have is E. Um, she is on Twitter um, as well, so she's tweeting out too. And so, you know, there's plenty of activity going on on Twitter as well as listening to what's going on here. And, you know, first of all, I just want to let everybody know there's a couple of exciting, exciting things happening, and we'll kind of recap this at the end. But, you know, really, if, you, if you're not aware, Community Manager Appreciation Day is coming up on Monday, January 28th. It's a huge day for community managers. It's not just for community managers. It's really for everybody um, to show appreciation for community managers. And one of the things that we're doing here at My Community Manager is having a 12-hour community manager hangout on that Monday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time, Chicago Time, Midwest Time, um, where Brew will be hosting the entire 12 hours because I'm going to be on my honeymoon getting married. And we have a stellar lineup of guests already in. We still have opportunities for people. So if you're interested in doing a panel, if you're interested in, in just getting on and talking about the specific topic, please let us know. We are more than happy to, uh, to start scheduling that in, and we will be announcing that this weekend, uh, kind of the beginning steps of that. So that's really exciting. We also have um, uh, a Hangout tomorrow at 11 a.m., our once monthly Saturday edition for those that can't join on Friday. So we're really excited about that as well. Um, so without further ado, let's just get the introduction started here. Um, and while I do some lookup of, of the community manager of the day, and I don't know, Brew, or do you have those slides ready? Or I know you just were on a call. So am I just going to wing the community manager of the day ones? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I didn't have anything prepared. Okay, so I'm going to blame my unpreparedness on you. How's that? <laughs> No, we, we, we won't have the slides, but I do want to go through some of the Community Manager of the Day. Um, if you're not aware, Community Manager of the Day is something we focus a different Community Manager each and every day of the week, Monday through Friday, in their own words. They're sharing their experience, their tips, their history, who they look up to, what conferences they're looking to go to, what books they found valuable. So there's a whole bunch of different content and, and information that comes from these individual community managers, which is very exciting, very insightful. And, um, you know, it was kind of an exciting week today, or this week, because we had quite a few different people. And on Monday, we had Elliot Bulkman with University of Reddit, which is you Reddit on Twitter. And I got to tell you, I'm not a big Reddit person, but I learned a lot from what he was talking about. We've actually conversed quite a bit during the week, and so I'm really excited for him. You can follow him at um, the Journalizer on Twitter personally, or he also runs the uh, U Reddit. That's just the letter U, and then Reddit Twitter account. Um, Next up, we had our first NBA community manager, um, Bob Stanky from the Minnesota Timberwolves came um, and was community manager of the day on Tuesday. Very exciting to see. Um, he's doing some interesting things that he's actually going to be writing about um, a campaign that he's running. Um, he's the first of his kind, I, I believe he told me, in the professional sports industry trying this campaign, and he's going to be sharing it right here on My Community Manager, which is pretty exciting, too. And then, I can't forget... Um, we just had to have this plan this way, Jeannie. We had your community manager, Ann Royce, 
Um, on uh, Wednesday, she was our community manager of the day, and Anne is just a fantastic person. She's also a personal friend of mine, um, and Anne has an amazing story because um, for those of you who don't know, and you probably don't unless you read her story, um, Anne's actually deaf, but you never let it you never see it as a as a you know holding her back in any form or fashion um, and she had a, a just a, a great story and Jeannie I'm just so so glad that she's with you um, as a as a small business you know having a community manager I, I'm really interested to hear your take on that too so hopefully you'll share a little bit of that and then um, yesterday we had we went to education we had Jeff Polkin from um, Connecticut College and he's um, Con C O N N College and um, personally he's also Jeff Polkin um, J E F F P U K L I N um, on Twitter so that was pretty exciting and then today we went back into sports and Brew I know you're disappointed he is the community manager for PBR but it's not Taps Blue Ribbon it's Professional Bull Riders Incorporated so very That's still pretty cool. It's That's still, still it's cool. still very cool, very cool. So we had um Mac on today. I think that's just very interesting to see, you know, we we hear another sports but not one that many people are aware of or at least that we hear of in the Midwest and in the Northeast, uh, you know, professional bull riding so it it was very exciting to kind of hear um, kind of how he got started and some of his inspirations so that's our community manager of the day and if you're interested um, just go to feedback software. And uh, I'm Allie Greer. I am the community manager at Scoopit, and I'm really excited to be in the customer service headquarters at User Voice right now. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to talking with you guys today. Excellent. And Colleen, hi, how are you? Oh, I think you might be muted. Uh, there's a little mute um, microphone button up or right. You want to unmute yourself. Okay, so I'm mute challenged. Oh, there you go. You're on. So go ahead and introduce yourself. There we go. All right. So uh, my name is Colleen, and I'm the community manager of uh, Virtual Hospice. It's a community of people who are dying, so it's a bit of a challenge, the biggest challenge that I've had so far. And uh, this is my first hangout, as you can see, because I'm mute challenged. <laughs> well, welcome. And uh, David, haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? Yeah, long time to see you guys. Um, I'm doing pretty good. Um, David, historian on Twitter. And... Uh, I'm a former community manager in the video game industry. Awesome, and it sounds like you're auto-tuning your voice today. So That's even better. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll just skip over G for a minute. Um, everybody, uh, I'm, my name is Brew. Uh, I'm House of Brew over on Twitter, uh, working with BTC Revolutions, um, and uh, do community management, um, social strategy, uh, things like that. So. Um, very happy to be here. Hopefully, Tim, uh, is your video working and everything? Tim, are you here? I think I'm back. Can you? Hear oh, me you now? are. Yeah, okay. we can hear you now. So, actually, <laughs> we'll we'll jump over to Mila, and then you can take over control again. Hi, everybody. My name is Mila Gates. Uh, I work for the Integer Group as a community manager based in Denver. So, it, uh, this is probably my tenth or twelfth 
hang out. So it's been nice to hang out with you guys regularly. And I am. T this is, I think, what I was doing when I realized that I was <laughs> something was going amiss. So um, I am Tim McDonald. I am the founder of my community manager. I am also the community manager at HuffPost Live, which is a live streaming network of Huffington Post. And I will pass it over to Sherry. Hey everybody, I'm Sherry. I am the community manager slash user experience manager at Sweet Tooth. And I'm really excited about today's topic because customer experience is totally what we do here. Um, so, and I also am in charge of community manager of the day here at my community manager. So if you have questions. <laughs> and it looks like Krista, you just popped in as well. Do you have a second to introduce yourself? Yes, sorry about that. It looks like it froze for a minute. I'm Krista, and I work at a startup called Action Lock as community manager. Awesome. And I guess I, Brew, I think we got everybody now, right? Since I yep, we have everybody. Uh, and okay. then now, and we left it uh, at, at Jeannie for our guests. So. All right. Well, perfect. Well, I'm going to let Jeannie introduce herself, but I, I already said that Jeannie is a friend of mine. She also served on the board of Social Media Club Chicago when we were both in Chicago. She still is. I'm in New York. Um, and Jeannie runs a company called 360 Connect. So Jeannie, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeannie, and I run a company called 360 Connects. We focus on customer experience evaluations. We do the qualitative analysis. So essentially, it's walking through the customer's actual experience. And we have a method called customer experience investigation we use to do that. Well, awesome. Well, you know, I'm, I'm really interested, and I know this might be a pretty obvious question, but I think it's still one that's very important, Jeannie. Mm -hmm. um, it's when before I knew you and met you in person, I had only heard of customer service. Mm -hmm. So can you can you really you know just define what customer experience is for us? Sure, it's actually not that obvious of a question. It's a really good question. So there are several different definitions of this throughout kind of the customer experience world, and a lot of it deals with perception. Um, how does a customer perceive your company? The way I look at it is customer experience is really any interaction and then the sum of those parts from when a customer or a potential customer, I should say, becomes aware of your brand all the way through when they either exit or start advocating for you. And there are lots of things that can happen in between. So I really look at what are those small moments that add up to the bigger experience. Um, there are usually some big milestones in there, but it's really the everyday interactions that we talk about as people because humans are really emotional and uh, data has become a big part of an analyzing the customer experience which is important but humans are just totally irrational <laughs> and emotional and so we talk about the little things a lot and that's really what adds up to that perception of do we love this company as a customer or do we hate this company enough to start talking about them on Facebook and everywhere we can. So I think with that you just started trying to show us how community managers should be concerned with the customer experience. Right? <laughs> I probably did. Sorry, am I skipping ahead? <laughs> no, no, I, I love it. I love it. It's just you know, but you know, so that being the definition, what what exactly is the difference between that and customer service? Um, the way I look at it is customer service is very reactive typically. If you think about how customer service reps are even defined in their job descriptions, a lot of times it's about being the recipients of those inbound calls. It's sitting in a call center, responding um, to customers who are calling in usually to complain or ask a question, and it's very reactive. I Customer experience, in order to really be a great customer experience, it has to be proactive, and you have to really look at planning the ideal situation and then every action you take trying to make sure that you're living up to that ideal scenario, and the customer service group and customer service in general is there 
because there will be times it doesn't happen and there will be times you have unhappy people and you have t people with questions and all those things. But again, that's very reactive as opposed to proactive with customer experience. So I'm just curious, um, for those of you that have been on the Hangout or haven't been on the Hangout, you know one of my rules is you take a seat here, you have to participate. Otherwise, you could just be taking the bleacher seats with the rest of the lurkers and watching and listening. <laughs> um, so this is the part where you can actually jump in. You don't need to wait for me to call on you. Um, tell us what you think customer experience is or what the differences are. Do you agree with, with Jeannie that it one's more reactive than proactive? I, I'm curious because I think that's a great definition, but I, I also can see some differences in different organizations. So does anybody have any thoughts on this? Well, I'll jump in since nobody's jumping in right away, but I, I think customer experience has a lot to do uh, with ev being, being uh, very attentive to every single touch point throughout a customer cycle. Um, and uh, so, so that means if, uh, if you have brand ambassadors and you're sending them something in the mail, uh, that the box is perfect. You think about when you open the box, what they're seeing next, uh, what they might be smelling. I mean, uh, taking a part of all the senses um, to, to really, um, you know, drive that entire experience, not like, oh, we're going to send them a box and they'll be happy for that, um, just mm -hmm. as one example. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think that you bring up a really good point that it's not, it's not just uh, the big moments and it's not just those things that are in the box. It's really thinking about everything around that. I would agree. Um, I didn't get the chance to introduce myself, but I definitely would agree. Um, I work with a hair care company and, you know, it's hair, and so stu so people, you know, it's about something that's visual. So you definitely want to share, you know, something that people can, um, you know, touch. And it's very tactile. It's very all and about how the packaging looks. And so um, it's really helpful to have, like you said, everything from what's in the box to, you know, from the touch point from a sale to what they get once they open that box to if they post a picture. All of those things are really great touch points in order to make sure that your community is kind of having this very magical, you know, kind of secret, you know, society kind of experience um, where they feel like they're a part of your brand in a way that's unique and special. So. And so, Therese, is, am I pronouncing your name right, Therese? Yes, yes, hi. Okay. Hi, hey, no, I'm so glad you're here. So, I mean, since we did miss you, and I just got to say right off the bat that that phone, it looks like it's gold plated, and I want one. <laughs> it's actually silver. Oh, it looks gold with the lighting or something. I'm like, I love it. <laughs> it's actually silver, and I was like, I was eating before, so I didn't, I saw everyone's introductions, and I didn't want to do that, so that was rude. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, where, what company are you with, or what, what, you know, what, where can we find you on uh, um, from a business? I am on Twitter. I am on Twitter. Um, at my own, my own, ha my own um, handle is at Therese Baskin. Um, I also manage um, a company called Perfect Locks, and so you can find me there at at Perfect Locks. Um, it's a extension. It's a hair extension company based out of uh, California, um, but I'm in Chicago since I'm a virtual. I'm a virtual member for them. So, well, perfect, perfect. Well, we're glad you're here. So, um, so does, I mean, some great points. Does anybody else have anything? Carter, you're not no. going to stay quiet, right? No, of course not. I was actually literally just going up to my unmute button. Um, I, I think that when you talk about customer experience, it's uh, several parts, right? It's what you do before, it's how your customers interact with the product, and I think that you can roll customer service into user experience. Um, I don't think that those two things are necessarily separate. Uh, for me, I think about when I go to Bank of America and I log in, that's part of my user experience. When I'm interacting and exchanging things, that's part of my user experience. And when something goes wrong, that's also part of my experience there. Um, and to be honest, customer service at Bank of America, for instance, really has a negative impact on my overall experience with that brand. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's dangerous to sort of say, you know, customer service is reacting and customer experience is proactive and going up before. I mean, it has to be all of that. Yeah, I would agree that customer service is definitely part of the customer experience. And I think the way I look at it is there's, it's kind of a map of where somebody finds your brand all the way through, and customer service has to be part of that. Um, but I think from a customer's perspective, a lot of times what it feels like is that the 
brand or the company didn't uh, plan enough. They were not proactive enough, and that's really what causes so many of the issues, and that's what causes that feeling of I all that effort we have as customers. The more effort we put in to get something that should be easy, the less we like a brand. Agreed. <laughs> and so, so, David, I know you were going to have to leave in a few minutes. Um, did you have anything you wanted to chime in with before you had to go? Um, you know, I think magical is a very fitting uh, title for this. I mean, we know that perhaps the most magical place on earth uh, has used a standard of treating everyone as a guest, um, and that would be Disney. Um, you know, and, and their customer service is, you know, you, you go to Disney World, you'll never find a dirty bathroom. Because, um, you know, it, that's what they're going to do. They're going to make your experience there as perfect as they possibly can. Um, there's never a cigarette butt on the ground. Nobody drops trash that you can see. It's constantly being monitored so that your whole experience there is perfect. And, and they're doing it proactively, not reactively. They're making sure that, you know, through the door, it's, it's going to be as good as it possibly can. You know, one of my favorite examples from Disney is that one of the most common questions at their parks that guests ask any of the workers is, what time is the 4 o'clock parade? <laughs> and I love that example because essentially what they figured out was that people were saying, what time is it going to come through here, this spot where I am? And so what they did was start training all of the people for answering that question in that context. And I think that's a brilliant example of being proactive and really thinking through what is the actual customer experience and not just checking it off a list. Well, and, and you know, um, Jeannie, I, I stole magical customer experience from your own website at 360 Connects, right? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, obviously, <laughs> I obviously wasn't that creative. I just took it right from your site. So, um, so you know, I guess that, that comes down to, you know, we're starting to talk about Disney, and, and maybe I should rephrase this question a little bit differently, but, you know, what do you do to increase the happiness rating? So, I guess, you know, what do you do to increase the, the magic, you know, <laughs> rating of your customers and your community? Because it really is something, I think, that there's so many different things, but how do, how do we actually kind of raise the bar? I mean, you, mm -hmm. you started giving an example of Disney, but are there other ones, or are there other ways that we can do that? Yeah, and whenever I answer this question, it feels a little self-serving because one of the things that is just a truth is that we as people have so many responsibilities, especially now. We're all doing like three jobs at once, and we all know that that report is due Friday, and I've got to get this, and I've got to get that. So it's very, very difficult to actually step outside of that role and look at the customer experience from a true outside-in perspective. So part of it is making that a priority. And you'll see that the best companies like Disney, like Zappos, like Apple, um, which I have an opinion on that lately too, but uh, they are really looking at that experience. If you take just a standard kind of shopkeeper, uh, a lot of times they walk in the back door every single day. So they literally never walk in the door that their customers walk into. And so they totally lose perspective of what does this look like walking in. And I think the same can be said for a lot of software as service companies, a lot of financial services that was brought up already, um, banking, things like that. We get so ingrained in our own kind of cultures and our own responsibilities that it's very difficult to do that. So that's, that's one thing I always recommend. Um, and the other is to really not only look at reports, because reports are fantastic, but they don't give you the full picture. And really challenge yourself to look at a report, and if you see the slightest change in a significant metric, really challenge yourself to go look at what is causing that. Because the slightest change is a window into the future. And if you can find something that one person is upset about, and they're vocal about, or that they're showing you by walking away, that means a lot of other people will follow them. And so it's really important to look at those little things as well. So do you have, I'm just kind of kind of questioning you because you're bringing up something that's very close to what I've been dealing with here in the last couple of days, mm -hmm. is, you know, what you say, 
if one person's vocal, that means a lot more are, are you know, thinking the same thing. Do you have any statistics, any figures on what that number is or what that one voice represents? Well, I, they, they're changing a lot, actually. The, one of the common ones is one in nine. Like if, you know, if one person tells you something, it means nine more people are thinking it at any given time. But I really believe that's a low statistic. I think there's a lot more. And the other thing that I've been really exploring lately is when you talk to brands about customer experience, a lot of times their end game, their goal is uh, brand advocates or evangelists. They think that's kind of the, the you know, goose that lays the golden egg because they're going to get you more and more customers, which is true. But I would argue there are a couple different categories of advocates where there's very active people, we all know them, who get out there and tell you all about the brand and they, anytime you talk to them, they have a different recommendation. And then there are kind of the rest of us who are not really ones to go on all of our social networks and say, I love this brand so much just because. But if somebody asks for our opinion, we're certainly going to tell them. And I think the same can be said for negative. So there's a lot of silent negativity out there where the brands can't even access it. They don't even know it's happening because people are just, you know, silently recommending um, by saying, I wouldn't go with them, shaking their head, or even within their own social circles that brands don't have access to, just sharing it there and, you know, you're not necessarily seeing that. And so I think we're becoming a little more disjointed in some ways because we used to be able to really see all the brand messaging that was out there and now people are getting much more sophisticated and our social networking is getting more sophisticated and I think we're we're you know relying on each other in a very different way than 10 years ago and so it's it's a challenge but I I would argue that that one in nine number is really really low so I would love to find better stats so if somebody else has those please let me know Okay, so does, you don't have to have the stats to, to speak next. You can just <laughs> you can actually just talk about you know what what you're doing or what you've seen or what you want to try and achieve. So, Colleen, I know we we haven't heard from you since the introduction. Do you have any any thoughts or? And don't forget to unmute. Yeah, before. I just yep. okay. <laughs> uh, so I've been um, I've just been sort of translating all of this into my context, which is a. Uh, Patients. So I run communities for patients, and uh, in at least in Canada, we have uh, universal health care. So mm -hmm. we're really quite reluctant to think of patients as customers, and I think that this attitude is quite transferable and actually should be translated into the patient experience. We should think of it as a, a customer experience, at least in, in the light, the way that you're talking about it, Jamie. Um, and I'm thinking of a, a story that uh, uh, someone told he was a hospital administrator and just noticed that a woman had been in the waiting room for an extremely long time and he brought her a pillow. And, um, you know, she might not remember exactly who brought her the pillow or why, but she does remember that it comforted her in a time of duress. And uh, that's probably the patient experience that she's going to take away from, from that interaction. And uh, it's likely to have made her have a better ex medical experience. And uh, I think that that's really translatable into um, all of the experiences that you've been talking about. Yeah, and Colleen, I would also add that healthcare and education, and there are a few other groups like this, um, patients are one group of customers, but then you have patient families, mm -hmm. you have all these other groups that you really have to think about their experience from their unique perspective as well because they have influence over the experience of the patients, right? So um, healthcare has done some really interesting things in the last few years. Uh, Cleveland Clinic is a great case study where they actually uh, developed a patient experience team essentially and one of the major things they did was re uh, designed the the hospital gown because they realized that nobody likes to have their bum hanging out <laughs> so they had uh, I think it was they had Diane von Furstenberg actually help yes. them design it so it's a wrap right. and it made everybody so much happier and it was one of those things that they actually you know it's one of those things that I bet patients have said to nurses for eons and yet everybody just accepted it as part of the experience and so making that small change 
made a big, big difference on the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't improve their experiences and refer to them as customers even though it's not by choice. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, it's okay to talk about the patient experience. And, um, you know, in, in the line of work you do, you have a whole community that really has to support this person in a, in a very difficult time. And I would imagine that by looking at those different experiences and really thinking about what is what is the ideal situation there, which is essentially what hospice is all about, right. then, um, you know, there's probably lots of opportunity to just take it up that next level because I would also, I would also bet that most people who go into that line of work have the right outlook. They really are full of empathy and compassion anyway, and so you're starting from a really good place because right. sometimes that's the biggest battle is having the right people in, in the room. Very much so. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Krista, what are you, what are you, um, what are you seeing in, in, with what you do? I mean, how are you trying to raise a bar with the customer experience, or, or do you even have any, any role or anything with that in your, in your position? So, um, one thing that I found to be really helpful is that uh, we have consistent messaging across Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, and um, on our website we've got the little alert chat feature. And I'm the person that they're going to be talking to if they um, if they contact us that way. Sometimes sales um, emails or people who just have general questions will come through me as well. And if they call, because we're working a lot with real real estate and retailers, um, industries that haven't necessarily gotten to the same level as a lot of other. Um, industries as far as social media and technology goes they're going to be calling us and I'm going to be answering the phone as well and it really is helpful having such a small office being able to do that and to have that consistent messaging um, with everybody so we're able to answer the questions the same way no matter what I think that that really helps the customer experience because they're not getting told one thing on one um, network and then something else whenever they call or if they you know, try to chat with us on, on our website. So that's something that I've found can be a bit much at times if we're getting inundated with different requests, but at the same time it's really helpful to our customer experience in the long run. And um, the people who take over account management after we go through the entire sales process with them, because we are an enterprise company, we are working business to business, they also have the same messaging and we sit down you know, frequently, and I'll make sure that we're telling everybody the same thing and having the same um, high level of excellence for for all of our customers. And that's like one of the really amazing things about working at a startup is that you've got this small team that you're working with, and they're just consistent messaging no matter what. And Krista, you brought up a great point about uh, really kind of honoring the way the customer wants to interact with you. Because a lot of times, if if you're online and you just want to send a quick chat to a company and they don't have that option and it says call here and then you get dumped into press one, press two, that's really frustrating because it's not the way the customer chose to do business with you. So the fact that you're offering all those different avenues is important and a lot of companies don't do that. So our community is a little bit different. Um, most of our followers are job seekers rather than customers, so we're not actually selling any product or anything. Um, and some of them have been out working for a while and ready for a change of pace or been unemployed for a long time. And um, lately, a huge majority of our followers are uh, college seniors that are just about to finish and get out into the world and um, you know the economy is getting better but it's not great and so they get really frustrated when they get yet another uh, you know turn down from another job um, and so it's been really hard to try to stay encouraging you know keep trying keep fighting for it keep applying here's more jobs you can try for um, but you know, it, it does get kind of depressing after a while when when they keep getting that no, and it's it's difficult to keep them uh, being positive. No, I think you know, you know, you bring up a great point because I I think and and I heard this with the with the patients too is you know I think too often we think about the customer experience when we're only talking about 
because it has the word customer in it. And I think it's very important to understand, and Jeannie, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is that should really be anybody that has the potential to be a potential customer or share news or talk to or influence a potential customer serve experience, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in a weird way, it does cover like humanity, which seems so broad and crazy. And there are customer experience people who really disagree with me on this subject, so I should say that, because some people really believe it is when they walk in your door and actually become a paying customer, that's when you start caring about them. But the great brands, we see them do this all the time. They start caring about you just because you're you. They don't care. And when you become a customer, you almost are proud of it. You know, There's a company out of Michigan called Moose Jaw that does such an amazing job with community building, and I'm sure all the community managers here are aware of them, they're really creating customer experience way before people become customers. And, you know, another great example is Warby Parker. They do a great job, too. And so you look at how, you know, I don't wear glasses. I got LASIK a few years ago, but I'm kind of tempted to order some just because they've been so amazing. Um, so next time I, I'll have my smart girl glasses on. Um, but the, the whole idea of customer experience, it's great that people are talking about it. But what makes me nervous is people get very overwhelmed because it can be like, oh my God, how are we going to tackle this? And so they start segmenting it and they start making these silos, which is exactly what kills the customer experience. So it's interesting right now because I feel like 2012 is kind of when customer experience became a buzzword for marketers and other people. But it's not really just about that experience either. And a lot of times the assumption is it's retail only or it's online only, or it's all these things only. And I really look at it with a very, very broad lens. So that, that's a perfect segue into the next question, which is how do you see community managers or community management departments working with the mm -hmm. customer ex experience departments? Because um, even though we do part of it, you know, a lot of companies have different departments that handle that. And so how do you see the two roles kind of working together? Well, I think it's essential that they do. Um, one of the things that I've seen in call centers is starting to translate, I've noticed, into community management. And one of those things is that the best call center reps are so good at their jobs that people call in, they feel like they got what they wanted, great, and they kind of move on. If it's not captured what people are calling in for over and over and over, that call center rep could look like a superstar, but you're not really proactively solving a problem. And one of my clients had this situation where people kept calling in after signing up for something because they couldn't figure out how to sign in again. And reps were just answering this question all day long. It took 30 seconds. Everybody was happy. Nobody was really seeing this as a pattern because it didn't fit into any of the predetermined checkboxes that they were given. So they just said, yeah, solved a problem. So with community management, I think you guys are in the front lines of what's happening. You're really the canaries in the coal mine because oftentimes before somebody will pick up the phone and call a company, you'll start seeing waves of what's causing pleasure or displeasure within the online community and within what they're saying and how you're engaging with your customers online. So I would say that you know if there's a way to make sure that whoever is responsible for the customer experience and unfortunately this isn't well defined company to company so sometimes you've got a customer insights team sometimes you have the VP of marketing is really the person who's in charge of customer experience etc if you can really work directly with them and maybe once a week have a check-in and say these are the patterns we're starting to see we don't have data yet but this is what we're starting to see we're hearing more and more people say this we're noticing that people are expressing this. We're noticing that people shared this. And it will start giving you clues as to that map of what's working and what's not for customers. And if they can react to that and help you actually take action around that, then that's a winning combination. The worst is when customers are saying things over and over and over. Somebody's saying, we're, we hear you, we're listening. And that person might be listening. But if they can't turn that into meaningful action, then it feels like, well, what are we doing? We're just talking. We're not really walking the walk. 
Well, and I, I just saw uh, Jen Emerson from Intelligent just put out that uh, give everyone in your organization a sense of ownership over the customer experience, include in a collaborative internal community. And her and I have talked about actually internal communities before, so <laughs> I, I know yes. where she's coming from. So I think that's a very valid point of how I really see this moving forward. As you said, you know, 2012 has been kind of the buzzword of community experience, and now it's really going to start maturing and growing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think community management's kind of in that same boat where, you know, it's it's been a buzzword, and it probably still will be for 2013, but I really think it's going to start maturing and evolving in, in internal communities, and I think really establishing the entire organization over the customer experience is going to be very critical. Well, and the point about individual ownership is an excellent point because if it's not part of your culture, if you're not living and breathing customer experience, then it probably won't work. Well, you need to have employees that aren't fearful of maybe making a mistake, you know, like mm -hmm. so that they can feel confident in themselves in, you know, making a split decision that's in the best eyes of the customer mm -hmm. um, and, and, and not being held back uh, for any reasons. So, Allie, um, we've heard from Carter. You haven't spoken up yet. Um, I'm interested because Scoop, it's not a huge company, so you probably don't have a separate customer experience department, but I think you do have a separate customer service department. So tell us, you know, kind of how you're working as a community manager within the customer experience role. Um, yeah, so this is actually going to be my, <laughs> the question where I chimed in because at Scoop, it, we are a, Besides, like aside from our engineers, we're a four-person team. So our customer service team and our community management team is sitting right here. <laughs> so <laughs> um, personally, from my experience, I think that it's um, they can't exist without each other because if you're, you know, part of the job as a community manager is making sure that everyone is happy and that everyone's having a positive experience with your brand and that they want to, you know, be coming back and interacting with you and things like that. And the root of that is your customer service because um, when you're doing the customer service, that's where you're finding out, you know, people's perception of your brand or the things that people are having problems with or the things that, you know, the things that people want from you. and. If, if that's separated as a community manager, you're not going to be able to, to communicate with your with your customers if you don't know, you know, if you don't have that insight kind of into um, what they want and what they're having problems with. So, I mean, for me, it's easy to say because I do both, but I think there's a huge overlap um, in what I find. I prioritize um, as important to do as a community manager. I get those things from what I see when I do customer support. Excellent. Interesting. Well, I, I am, I, I'm like, I could keep, I think each one of these questions I could probably talk to for a full hour, but I know we got two more we want to get through, so let's, let's pop in the next one, which is, you know, we've talked a lot, Jeannie, about, I think, overall, just our community, right, or mm -hmm. our customers, but all of us have what we refer to as our best customers. And so, you know, what can we do with the customer experience to make the best customers feel like they're part of something really special? I love this question. Um, I think few companies really take advantage of this. And sometimes it's frustrating when you are um, really trying to support a brand and you're not recognized as you know, thanks for doing that, or I saw that you shared that, or we love you too, anything. <laughs> um, so I think part of it is we, as humans, love to be recognized like that. So simple recognition can go a long way. But on top of that, really being proactive about finding out what customers want and inviting some of your best customers into a customer advocacy group or kind of a special community where they can get previews to things, they can be part of product design or um, any of those kind of sneak peeks, that can go a long way. And then, you know, I think right now especially there's there's a big trend towards um, discounts and rewards. Uh, a lot of companies do this, but maybe not in the way that make people feel very valued. I would say surprises are great. So when you surprise, like a software service company that I've worked with um, in the past, they actually will go through about once a month and pick out like 10 customers who have just been with them for a long time and just auto renew them 
like for six months to a year and send them an email and say we just know that you love our product and we're really happy to have you as a customer so here you go and nine out of ten times what does that customer do they talk about it they get online and they say can you believe this company did this for me and I'm so happy and everything like that and then there's also um, there's also a lot of gamification going on with customer experience, which is uh, which is fun. You know, people like to kind of go through and get to that next level and have fun around a special community. And so, I think community management is actually a huge part of rewarding your best customers. Okay, so now I need to. Sure, so I have I, to jump in here because otherwise Tim's going to call me you, out. If you <laughs> jump in, Sherry, on this particular question, you knew I was going to call you out. Didn't you see me in the comments? I totally jumped in already. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm, well, because I'm kind of torn on this, right? Because customer experience and rewarding customers is a huge thing, like in how we act as a company here, but it's also what our software does. <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, but because of that, like we're very in tune with um, customers and with companies on how to help them actually reward their customers, how to analyze like who are your most influential customers or who are your most valuable customers because it's not always who you think. Like mm -hmm. we actually um, are able to look and see who like velocity of orders versus um, overall orders because it may be that you think this person spent. 100 grand me today, so they're my most valuable customer, but maybe someone else who's been consistently spending like $600 every so often, and that's actually more valuable to you. Um, so we've done a lot, of, a lot of studies on this, and it's just, it's fun to be able to pick out people and to be able to reward them. Maybe it's, uh, in the e-commerce world, is which, which is what I'm a part of, uh, is obviously rewarding can be more of a monetary value, um, or maybe send them a that you maybe don't normally have. Um, you can also send them swag. People get super excited about swag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have people tracking me down all the time to get our pink sunglasses that we call sweet shades, and it's just it's a lot of fun. So it's it's very easy and simple to reward people, and they get super excited about it. Well, Sherry, I think defining who your best customers are and how you will define them is really important too, because if you're yep. just Picking it based on you know maybe the longest uh, tenure or the most money in a year, um, they might not be your best customers. And I think part of this is right. really yep. looking at who's engaging and who's participating and who wants the love as well. And do you share absolutely that criteria absolutely publicly? Do you share that criteria? What criteria? The criteria of what makes a best customer. Um, our software does. Yes. Do we actually rewarding customers? Not really. No. It just depends on. I mean, what are your goals at that point? Are you looking to encourage long-term customers? Or are you looking to encourage people who have social influence and are going to be talking about you a lot? Um, it just depends on what your organization's goals are at that point. It can vary depending on the company. I think there's a little bit of a danger um, in, um, you know, I, I definitely think you need to define kind of who are your best customers, but I, I kind of look at it like, you know, you want to treat every customer interaction like you're with the prettiest girl at the dance um, because, you know, you, you never know, um, you, you know, wh what kind of unprompted recommendation that person might have for you because of that great interaction. You know, you want customers to say, wow, these guys are awesome. And, uh, and, and, and not just, you know, so, so you're always trying to go over the top, um, not just, you know, kind of like you were saying before, uh, Jeannie is check marking off. Okay, cool. I, I responded to that tweet or, you know, mm -hmm. I did this or I did that. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I also get on my soapbox about when data tells part of the story. And a perfect example is I have a couple different bank accounts for different needs. And I have a small one at Chase just for cash and stuff. And they keep sending me marketing materials for like a 20 year old college student. Like I don't have my own credit card yet and all these things that it makes me feel like they don't know me at all because they're just looking at very hard data figures and not looking at the big picture. And I think that um, 
defining your best customers for the sake of if you do have a reward program or if you have a special community you're trying to build, um, I think that's when definition is very, very important because you want to make sure the right people are included. But I totally agree with what you were saying that it's really important to treat everybody as if they're a VIP because otherwise you run the risk of um, ignoring people. That happens a lot or just kind of being apathetic about a huge group of your customers. When I, I just, I, I mean, Brew, you, you hit it on the head, I think, and that gets to the point of the, the whole experience being much greater than just your customer because you never know who, what, when something magical is going to happen, right? And what's going to spark that and who that person is going to be to be that spark. And so it really is making sure that for everybody that's potentially coming in contact with you, your service, your product, your message, that it really is going to leave them something to remember in a very positive way. Is that a good way to kind of sum it up, Jeannie? <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. And as I kind of was saying before that, like you were saying, it's not customers, it's everybody. Because who's to say that the person that you either embrace or turn away today could be a customer in the future? And so if you're really looking at revenue or bottom line, then that's a good way to sell it because I've had experiences and I'm sure we all have where you interact with a brand the first time and you think, ugh, I'm never ever going to be a customer there. And you tell people about it. So even though they have no idea who you are, you're in none of their databases, you are going around as a detractor to their brand. And the same thing can happen on the flip side. And so I think if we all look at it as we're all kind of in this together and we're all human beings and we're all just trying to get stuff done and have a little bit of fun in our day, then the world will be a better place. <laughs> okay, now this is the part that we all get to, and Jeannie, you get to go first because this is what you do for a living. You know, what are, no, I'm, I just, I, I forgot what I was going to ask the next question. You know, <laughs> I know it relates to, to how each of us have done it, but oh yeah, how, you know, what's your favorite way that you've helped improve the customer experience for one of your communities? Uh, I think that a lot of it has to do with um, making sure that the people who are interacting with your customers actually are have the right information, the right tools, and are the right people. Because if you hire wrong for customer-facing employees, then you are somewhat doomed. So I like really looking at that side of things. Who, who is dealing with the customers and how can you help support them the best? Okay. And do you have any, any like actual examples that you want to throw out to us? Well, <laughs> that's hard for me to do with real brands that I work with. So I'm, well, I know you can't say all the brands and all the clients yeah. you have. So if you don't want to, I'll let you off the hook and we can let everybody else go. <laughs> all right. All right. I'm going to Plead the fifth. But. Okay. <laughs> okay, so so who else has a story? Who who hasn't talked here in a while? We got Therese, we got Mila, we still got Krista, Colleen, you haven't talked for a while. Carter, we haven't heard from you since the beginning. I have one. Um, so actually, uh, when, when I started at User Voice, I saw we do uh, customer feedback, and I thought that our forum was actually you know not paid attention to enough. Um, so what I did was actually really simple. I, I just took the initiative and I went in and I just replied to like all these ideas. It took a month and I just replied to every single one of them. And even if we weren't able to do their idea or we had to defer an idea or we couldn't do that integration, you know, just letting those people know that they've been heard was like the best thing I've ever done since I've been here. Um, and that's something that I keep up now. So now I just really focus on anytime anyone says anything, you know, even if it's a lot. I'll stay at work later, I'll check it at midnight or something like that before I go to bed. Just make sure that like everyone's heard, even if it's a no. I, I could I have one. Um I, I there was when I first started with my company and I've only been with them with this particular client really recently, um, no one was replying to their at replies at all. <laughs> um and so, you know, it's like hello, they're speaking directly to you. Do you realize you need to wave back a little? Um, you know, and it's, and, it, and I get it, you know, a lot of it is, you know, chatter about customers who've bought a product and they're just, you know, kind of saying where it's from, but that's important too, you know, and I tried to have, you know, have that conversation of, 
I want to speak to every single person, you know, and say, hi, you know, thank you for, you know, liking our brand. Thank you for buying our brand. Thank you for, you know, just giving a damn, um, you know, but, <laughs> it, and that's important, right? It's just like waving at every person and going through emails, you know, and I'm still kind of wading through the waters of that. Um, when I see, uh, you know, I saw an unread message today in Facebook and I think I almost had a heart attack. Um, you know, just some of those things that really make a difference in terms of just being, you know, just being able to say, yes, you are out there and I see you and thank you. It's so important. And do you know how appropriate it is that you're actually talking through a telephone when you gave that answer? Because <laughs> because this is what I tell small business owners or when I, use, when I consult with people. When people talk to you or mention you on Twitter, when they write on your Facebook page, it mm -hmm. just, it, would you ever think of not picking up the telephone when it was ringing? That's mm -hmm. the analogy that I give, and and you just gave that point while you were on the phone, so it was like it was a perfect. <laughs> a perfect <laughs> My prop <one>. worked. My <laughs> prop worked. <laughs> and and yeah. oh, go ahead, Brew. I was gonna say, Tim. You know, another. It's funny when you say like the the phone um, analogy because. Like sometimes that's what I even think about when I look at um, the Facebook wall, where all it is is someone's just clicking like on your thing. That's you know, it's like answering the phone. A customer wants to say something to you, and you just smile. <laughs> um, you know, like just take the extra second to get you know to to actually respond to them, and you know, just slow down for a minute and respond, and and that can go mm -hmm. a, a lot even even bigger than a like. So, I I personally really believe that at the end of the day we all just want to interact with human beings and so the more that we have evidence of that the more we're happy we're happier customers and we're loyal customers because we like to interact with people and I don't for those of you that don't know when you're in a Google Hangout there's a little private chat I just need to say this because I don't know if anybody got it but um, obviously Google chat does not support or at least in Hangouts does not support the Facebook Emocon for the thumbs up, which is the Y in the parentheses. <laughs> so I was trying to get Brew a thumbs up on that and just like it, but it didn't work. So. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody have? I mean, we just have a couple minutes. Does anybody have any last little tidbit of what they've done or what you know what they've seen to really you know really make their experience with their customers change? Well, I actually got. Oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I've got one that's not from my company, but something I've experienced as as a user um, from Lyft, a ride, an on-demand ride-sharing service in San Francisco. They have um, events where they bring their drivers together with the people who are using them, and then sometimes they throw out things like shirts for people. They've invited um, some of us who use them and tweet about them a lot to their office for lunch, and they dropped off like a Christmas ornament at Christmas time. And just, just little things like that make me want to talk to even more people about them all the time, even though the reason why they're doing that is because I'm already, you know, talking about them all the time is you get the people who are really big advocates and you just keep throwing stuff at them that it takes no time or effort on your part and you just bring them back in for more and they're going to keep talking about you. Mm -hmm. So this is going to sound really simple. Um, but having the correct link is always a good idea. Um, when I first started, we had posts that would go from the Twitter account to a Facebook post to a dead link. And it drove me crazy. And there were bad grammar and bad spelling and the links didn't work. And um, as simple as it is, getting information correct, I feel like that's priority number one. Before you can even start having conversations with people, about the content, you have to have the right information out there. So I feel like it's really silly to say, but that's one thing I had to fix when I got here. That is not silly at all. I, I mean, I, I am a firm believer, and Jeannie knows this when I, when I was working with her at SMC, is it's all about sharing the link directly to, to where you want people to go. If you're making them go to your home page and then find the event and then find the registration page, mm -hmm. and then, you know, I mean, that is the worst experience that a user can ever have, especially when we're in this mode of doing everything fast, taking time. As, as a, especially as a community manager, to share the direct link to the information that the person asked for is so worth the time it takes. I mean, it's so simple. I, yeah, I totally agree. It's so simple, but so many people overlook that very fact. Well, and again, it goes to effort, because the more effort you're making somebody take, then 
like every step that you're making additional effort kind of chips away at their loyalty and at their happiness and so why not make it as easy as possible so that they don't have to put in so much effort awesome well this has been fantastic um, Jeannie where can everybody find you what's your website what's your Twitter handle how can they find you uh, my website is 360 Connext, and it's spelled C O N N E X T dot com. So it's connections and next. Um, and I'm also Jeannie with two N's, J E A N N I E C W on Twitter. And uh, I'm also on Google Plus and Facebook and LinkedIn and everywhere. And I love you guys. You're doing great work for the customers, so keep it up. Please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and thank everybody. Um, like I announced, the January 28th is Community Manager Appreciation Day. Please get in touch with us if you want to be involved. It's up on our website, um, and I'm going to be bad here and just say mycmgr.com and then go to the blog and search for <laughs> things, so I'm not giving you a great <laughs> customer experience. <laughs> but I will, I will put the link in it once I, once I write about this tomorrow and sum everything up. Um, also, tomorrow we have a very special hangout. We do one the second Saturday of every month for those that can't join on Fridays. We are talking about sponsorships, so how you get sponsorships in a winning way that both you and your company or event win in conjunction with the sponsor that you're getting. Um, so we want you to invite you to that too. And um, I just I. I can't thank everybody enough for being here. It's always the quickest hour of my week. I look forward to it every Friday, and I just want to thank all of you for coming. I think this is the first time we've had two people in a hangout window, so Carter, Allie, thank you so much, <laughs> and we'll see everybody next uh, Well, we'll see everybody tomorrow, or if you're not available to come tomorrow, we'll see you next Friday. Bye.